This is Chemical Processes for Micro and Nanofabrication. I'm Chris Mack and this is Lecture 12, Part 3 of our series of lectures on thermal oxidation. Our reading for this lecture is Chapter 4 of our Campbell textbook. Last time we talked about the Deal Grove model. We saw that there was three sequential uh, flows of reactant. Uh, first, there was the flow of reactant from the bulk gas to the surface of the silicon dioxide film, a diffusion process. After that ox oxidant, uh, either oxygen or water, adsorbs onto the surface uh, following a Henry's law, um, solubility law, uh, we have another diffusion step, the diffusion of that reactant through the oxide film. Um, that's step two in this figure. And finally, once the oxidant reaches the silicon dioxide, it reacts with, excuse me, reaches the surface of the interface between the silicon dioxide and the silicon. It reacts with the silicon at that interface, forming silicon dioxide. Um, using all of these uh, three steps, we were able to derive a rate equation, which in simplified form, using these lumped constants A and B, uh, looks like this, where the rate of oxide growth per unit time equals B divided by two times the oxide thickness plus A. The fact that there's an oxide thickness here is because of the, the longer time it takes to diffuse if I have a thicker oxide. We also saw that it was very easy to solve this rate equation by integrating and doing so gave us our standard form of the Deal Grove model uh, shown here. See, it's got a second order term and a first order term, the two constants, and then we added a third constant, tau, into this mix. Tau took into account the possibility that there's an initial oxide film on the wafer. So we might start with a bare silicon, in which case T0 is zero and tau will be zero, but we might start with um, 100 nanometers, 1,000 nanometers of oxide on the wafer when we put it into the oven, in which case the oxidation begins more slowly uh, because it already has to go through this 1,000 or 100 nanometers of oxide film before a uh, reaction can take place. The constants A and B are lumped parameters related to the more fundamental terms like diffusivities and Henry's law constant, partial pressures of the gas, rate constant at uh, the surface, and the mass transfer coefficient. Given this Deal Grove model, let's look at its properties. Let's, let's look um, at the nature of oxidation uh, based on this model. Here is um, some examples of uh, the output of that model. Um, which also is basically examples of the experimental data of oxidation. Here I show two kinds of oxidation, wet and dry, at a temperature of 1000 degrees C. We have the oxide thickness as a function of oxidation time. Uh, these units of microns and hours are pretty typical. Sometimes we might have nanometers for thinner oxide films as the units, but we're going to use microns for thickness and hours for time uh, here. Notice how much faster the wet oxidation is compared to the dry. Also notice these two regions. So initially, we have a very f a much faster oxidation that starts out in a linear fashion. That is, oxide thickness varies linearly with time. But then uh, it switches to a parabolic behavior. That is, the oxide thickness goes as the square root of time uh, for the thicker oxide thicknesses. We'll, we'll talk more about that in a moment. First, uh, let's talk about the parameter tau. Now, this is a great source of confusion to many students. Um, if I have some initial thickness, T0, on the wafer at the time I begin my oxidation step, you cannot think of this as simply an additive process or a linear process where if I have 100 nanometers of oxide and I want to grow another 100 nanometers of oxide, uh, I simply look at how long it would take to grow 100 nanometers and add it on top and I would be done. It doesn't work that way. 
Deal Grove is a nonlinear model, and so initial oxide thickness means that we start the oxi oxidation process at a slower rate. So if, if this is the initial thickness at time zero, we begin oxidizing at this slower rate because of that thickness that the uh, oxygen or water has to diffuse through. Uh, this is equivalent to shifting the time axis. That is, it's equivalent to beginning the oxidation at a time minus tau, letting it run until it reaches the thickness that we start with, and then it continues from there. So, so uh, I could have thought of this process as beginning the oxidation here at uh, now minus tau is uh, minus one hour, letting it run for an hour to reach the thickness T0 that I actually start with and then continue on. So tau is calculated from this formula. You can see it's a function of both A and B and uh, therefore, we'll, as we'll see, we'll have all the temperature, pressure, or other dependencies that uh, A and B have. Let's look at the properties of this model. So we have this rate equation as we saw. There are two regions we can think of. We can think of a region where T ox, the thickness of the oxide film, is much smaller than A over 2, uh, or when T ox is much bigger than A over 2. So if T ox is much smaller than A over 2, that means this term, 2 times T ox, can be neglected. And in that regime, we, when T ox is much less than A over 2, we neglect this, and of course, the rate is simply B over A. In other words, uh, we have a linear rate equation. The rate at which the oxide grows is a constant, and the oxide thickness is linear with time. The slope, B over A, we call the linear rate constant. So this is the linear regime, which happens for small time and more particularly for thin oxides. Uh, the critical thickness, where we make the transition uh, in, out of the linear regime, will be A over 2. So when you look at that parameter A, just think about A over 2 as, as the, the transition point or the cutoff of the linear regime. Likewise, if we look, think about thick oxides, where T ox is much greater than A over 2, we join the parabolic regime. So in that case, the term A here can be neglected as small compared to 2 times T ox. So our rate is B over 2 times T ox, about. And when I solve that, I simply get this second order equation. T ox squared is linear with time. Or the thickness of the oxide goes as the square root of the oxidation time. We call this the parabolic regime. and we have that parabolic rate constant, B. Uh, so it's very com uh, common, even though we have two parameters A and B, to in fact mostly refer to the parabolic rate constant B and the linear rate constant B over A. So let's look at this model versus some data. Is it a good model? Does it, does it work? Right. You can't just derive models and then say you're done. You always have to compare these models to data, find out when they work, and often find out the regimes where they don't match reality. All models make assumptions. There are regimes where those assumptions don't hold, and so there are points when the model uh, should not be used. So when we compare the model versus data, the first thing we find is when we are doing wet oxidation, we see excellent agreement over all of the ranges of, of uh, oxide thicknesses. Well, that's great. We can use the Deal Grove model for wet oxidation. We don't have to think much about it. But for dry oxidation, we find that there's a regime where the model does not do a good job. One of the assumptions must not be correct in the model when I have really thin oxides. And that's the regime. For thin oxides, the first 20 or 30 nanometers of thickness of that oxide film we have a much higher growth rate for that oxide than the Deal Grove model predicts. Well, what does that mean? Well, we still like the Deal Grove model. It's very easy to use. It's very simple. 
but it's simply not good at predicting oxide growth for thicknesses less than 30 nanometers. In the very early days of the semiconductor industry, in the 70s, even in the 80s, that was not a big problem because we always grew oxide films that were bigger than 30 nanometers. It wasn't too much of a problem. But today, we, we will often deposit or grow thinner oxide films, in which case we just have to recognize that the deal Grove model is not good enough. There are some uh, in other models that fix this problem, and they work pretty well. They're actually mostly extensions of the deal Grove model where an extra term is added to the rate to account for this faster growth at thinner values of, of TOX. So what do we do? Well, because we had this faster growth rate initially, and then after that, the rate is the same as deal Grove predicts, we're going to fudge our model. We're going to fudge the deal Grove model to kind of account for this anomalously fast growth rate in the, over the first 30 nanometers. What we'll do is we'll use tau, or we'll use T0, to account for this faster initial growth. We'll add a little extra uh, thickness um, because of that experimental growth rate is just a little bit faster than our model growth rate. Uh, here's how it works. Um, here is an example of some data. So uh, the data shows that the growth rate starts out very, very fast and then starts slowing down more. When we fit this, and this keeps going um, for longer times, when we fit this to the deal Grove, we find out that from about 30 nanometers of thickness on, we can get a pretty good fit with the deal Grove model. Right? Out here, there's just no problem. Deal Grove fits the data perfectly. But out here, it doesn't. But to make this fit work, we had to assume a certain initial thickness. That initial thickness is really not there. Right? That thickness we find, experimentally, is 23 nanometers. There is no 23 nanometers of oxide on the wafer when we begin. We're only faking it. We're assuming that there's 23 nanometers just to get a good fit for the thicker uh, um, regime. Whoops, I'm sorry. Uh, for the thicker regime out here. So. Uh, what it means is we can get a good fit with deal Grove in dry oxidation, but only past about 30 nanometers or so. In this region here, you just cannot assume that the deal Grove model will give you the right prediction. It also means we, we need to add this experimentally determined empirical fudge factor, uh, T0 of 23 nanometers, into our data. Now, deal and Grove, when they initially looked at this, found that this T0 of 23 nanometers was the same for all of the temperatures um, for dry oxidation. For wet oxidation, this was not a problem. We didn't have this, uh, this difference in the model uh, compared to the data. Um, but, in, but in the dry case, we do. And T0 was about constant for all the conditions that they were looking at. Uh, but it's often more convenient to use a tau value in the model instead of T0. So if you take the tau value, T0 value rather, the initial oxide thickness, and put it in this formula with the given A and B, you'll get a value of tau. And then that's the value we actually tabulate along with A and B. So we'll have a three-parameter model, A, B, and tau. Tau will be a function of temperature, but mainly because A and B are a function of temperature, we'll assume T0 remains at 23 nanometers whole time. So given that, we can collect a set of parameters A, B, and tau uh, for oxidation. This is uh, table 4.1 from the Campbell textbook, but all this data is in fact contained in all these parameter values are contained in Deal and Grove's uh, original 1965 paper. Here we have various temperatures, 800 to 1200 degrees C, and for dry, we have A, B, and tau uh, listed. Note that A has units of thickness, microns. B is microns squared per hour. And tau has units of time in hours. Note that tau changes dramatically. But T0, that faked 
initial oxide thickness is 23 nanometers for each of these cases, and the variation in tau is simply a function of, of the changes in A and B. For wet oxidation, they actually bubbled uh, oxygen through water at 95 degrees C, and that produced about 640 tor of uh, water vapor in the atmosphere that was used for the oxidation. And under those conditions, which are pretty typical, um, the A and B values are those shown here, and tau is zero. Uh, the precision of all these constants is about plus or minus 2%, um, except for these two values of A, because they've gotten so small, the, the precision of these two values are more like plus or minus 12%. Um, but because they're so small, they have, they're not having a big impact on the growth rate anyways. Uh, so uh, the constants are reasonably accurate. That really means the, the model does a pretty good job of fitting. Um, well, that's one of the implications. The other thing I want to note is that all of this data is for 111 wafers. We'll find out shortly that when we change the crystallographic orientation of the wafer, it changes the oxidation rate. And we'll have to make a correction to these parameters if we use wafers that are not 111. Well, given a set of deal Grove parameters and uh, uh, some different temperatures, uh, we, we can predict the amount of thickness for a, a given amount of oxidation time um, uh, using the deal growth model. If we need to, we can interpolate between these. The way you would interpolate would be on a, a log scale as 1 over temperature because uh, we'll assume that each of these follow an Arrhenius behavior. So let's look at that, the temperature dependence of these parameters. Here are plots of the data from that table. Um, uh, on a, a standard Arrhenius plot. We'll plot the log of the rate constant. In this case we have uh, the parabolic constant B. Over here we have the linear rate constant B over A. We plot the log of these versus 1 over the absolute temperature and we find a straight line. Uh, again these are for 111 wafers and these two figures are out of the Campbell textbook. Um, but it's simply plotting the data from that previous table. We get a very good straight line, which means if we wanted to interpolate to a different temperature, uh, sorry, if we wanted to interpolate to a different temperature, we would need to use an, uh, a linear interpolation on a log 1 over temperature scale. A couple of things uh, we'll note about these rate constants. Uh, they're quite different, the B over A. Um, activation energy is larger than the B activation energy. Uh, the activation energy of B over A is about the same for both wet and dry, but it's quite different for wet and dry uh, for the parabolic rate constant B. Let's see if we can understand that a little bit. The expected parameter behavior is based on our knowledge of what A and B are like in terms of more fundamental parameters. A is two times the diffusivity of the oxygen through the silicon dioxide film multiplied by 1 over H plus 1 over Ks. Ks is the rate constant of reaction at the silicon surface. 1 over H is the mass transport coefficient, a lumped parameter of other things uh, that's a function of how fast uh, the oxidant can reach the silicon dioxide surface. Typically H is much, much bigger than Ks, so A is about equal to 2 times the diffusivity divided by Ks. B, uh, 2D H P G over N1. Uh, D, that same diffusivity. H is the Henry Law constant, which really tells you how soluble that uh, oxidant is in the silicon dioxide film. Uh, it's also B is, is proportional to the partial pressure. And then our linear rate constant B over A, you'll notice that the diff diffusivities cancel out. And we have B over A is about equal to uh, the, the rate constant Ks, uh, H Henry Law constant times uh, partial pressure of the oxidant in the gas divided by N1, which is simply the density of oxygen. Um, in the silicon dioxide film as uh, the density of molecules. Uh, that number, by the way, N1, varies 
whether we're using H2O or O2, uh, because there's twice as many oxygens in O2 um, per molecule, uh, uh, N1 is half as much for O2 as it is for H2O. Now, let's think about the temperature behavior of these two parameters. B, what affects the temperature of B? Well, D will follow, the diffusivity will follow an Arrhenius behavior, and that will dominate. H is a function of temperature a little bit, of course PG uh, goes as, as um, um, temperature, but D will go exponentially with temperature, and therefore the temperature behavior is mostly determined by this diffusivity D. B over A, on the other hand, the temperature dependence is mostly determined by this rate constant Ks. So when we look at the difference in the temperature dependence, we see it's really a difference between the activation energy of Ks versus the activation energy of the diffusivity. And sure enough, when we go back and look at the previous slide and look at the difference in the activation energies, the linear rate constant B over A, an activation energy of about 2 electron volts, or 46 kilocalories per mole, that is almost exactly the energy of a silicon-silicon bond. In other words, the activation energy for Ks, we would expect it to be the energy it takes to break a silicon-silicon bond, because that's the hardest thing to do. Once you've done that, it's very easy for that silicon to react with the oxygen and form silicon dioxide. So um, it is completely consistent to see an activation energy of about 2 eV when the silicon-silicon bond energy is about 2 eV as well. Uh, it confirms what we see here, uh, where B of A is determined mostly by this uh, K sub S term, in terms of its temperature dependence. On the other hand, the uh, parabolic rate constant B, its temperature dependence is mostly determined by the diffusivity. And the diffusivity of oxygen um, has a lower activation energy. Um, and also note that there's a difference here between the diffusivity of oxygen through the silicon dioxide film and the diffusivity of water through the silicon dioxide film, and therefore we get two different activation energies. Uh, for the case of the linear rate constant B over A, they're both dependent upon, they're always dependent upon Ks. Ks is about breaking the silicon-silicon bond, and it doesn't really matter uh, whether we have water or molecular oxygen as the reactant. Now, there's other dependencies besides temperature we can look at. Oh, one last thing before I go there. Uh, remember that the wet oxidation is much, much faster than dry. Why is that? What would make that true? Well, both B and B over A are much larger for wet versus dry. Well, it's not the partial pressure. Those are the same um, uh, for wet versus dry. And one's different by a factor of two. H is different, well, D and Ks are going to be different, D is going to be different maybe a little bit, Ks, not different at all, wet and dry. The big difference, however, is H. The Henry's Law constant is much, much higher, orders of magnitude higher for water than for oxygen. In other words, water is just much more soluble in a silicon dioxide film than molecular oxygen. Uh, so as a result, much higher H results in much higher values for both B and B over A when we have wet oxidation versus dry. All right, pressure dependence. Well, what do we expect from looking back? We expect both B and, a, and B over A, the parabolic and the linear rate constant, we expect them both to be directly proportional to the partial pressure of the oxidant and the gas. The model says that a is independent of pressure. Um, and this turns out to be true mostly. A is independent of pressure. And uh, for wet oxidation, both B and B over A are proportional to the partial pressure of the oxidant. So everything for wet oxidation follows exactly what we would expect to happen. But for dry oxidation, we find something just a little bit different. A is still independent of pressure. B is still proportional to the partial pressure, but we find that B over A is proportional to the partial pressure of, of O2 to the nth power 
where n is somewhere between 0.5 and 1. It's typically more like 0.7 or 0.8. So that's an interesting uh, fact. Well, why would it be, why would we see this difference for dry O2 when everything works so perfectly for wet oxidation? Well, if we have um, atomic oxygen diffusing through the silicon dioxide, we would expect B over A to be proportional to the partial pressure um, of, of the oxygen in the gas. But if we have molecular oxygen diffusing and reacting, we would expect N to be 0.5. When we see N 0.7 or 0.8, what we suspect is that both oxygen and molecular and atomic versions of oxygen are involved. Um, there's still some confusion and, and uh, some unknowns there as to exactly what's going on, but this is the normal interpretation from the experimental observation that B over A goes to the partial pressure to uh, a power of about 0.7 or 0.8. Another interesting factor is crystal orientation. It turns out, you know, as, as you recall, we can make silicon wafers that have different crystal orientations. We have 100 wafers, 110 wafers, and 111 wafers. Um, 100 are the most common. 111s are used sometimes. 110s much less frequently. Uh, but when you think about it, uh, we have oxygen arriving at the silicon dioxide silicon interface and reacting. The question is, what are the number of silicon atoms per unit area on the wafer sur surface? Uh, that is going to depend on the crystal orientation. If I change the orientation, I change the density of the atoms. And in particular, I change the density of the silicon-silicon bonds available for reaction. Uh, this density uh, varies with crystal orientation. For example, the 111 crystal has about 74% more silicon-silicon bonds per unit area than a 100 crystal. So the ratio is about 1.74. What we find, uh, what this will do is affect the value of K sub S. K sub S has built into it the concentration of silicon, or in particular the concentration of silicon-silicon bonds that are available to be broken in reactions to take place. So if I change the density of these bonds, I'm going to be changing the value of Ks. And the consequences we see experimentally is that B is independent of Ks, and thus the crystal orientation. Uh, and of course we see that from, from the uh, e equations we have for B. But for B over A, which is dependent upon Ks, uh, B over A is 1.68 times smaller for the 100 wafers than the 111 wafers. Now you remember that our table and our graph that we showed uh, the values of the parabolic and linear rate constants us, were all for 111 wafers. So if we wanted to use the values of B and B over A in the table, um, and the value of tau for that matter, in the table, um, for 100 wafers, we'll have to do this conversion. All right, B and it will stay the same, but B over A will be uh, 1.68 smaller, times smaller for 100 compared to 111. Now, a couple other factors. We'll finish up uh, substrate doping. Substrate doping does impact the rate of oxidation. It's kind of interesting how it does. Turns out that higher doping levels cause an increase in B over A, but not B. Now, when something affects B over A, but not B, you can expect it to be due to K sub S, the, the surface reaction rate constant, because that's the main difference between those two uh, uh, linear and par parabolic terms. So higher doping level causes an increase in Ks, basically. Why is that? Well, it's probably due to an increase in the crystal defects the more you dope, the more crystal defects you get. And that, those crystal defects are good sites for breaking up the crystal to create um, silicon dioxide 
and for the volume expansion. We're going to talk about volume expansion in just a moment. Also, you might recall that we add a little bit of HCl to the gas during the reaction. Uh, something in the range of 1 to 3, maybe up to 5 percent HCl is added. And the goal is to remove the metal ions, both in the gas and in the film. Uh, things like sodium and potassium that can be uh, ugly contaminants in our film. They get reacted with HCl. An interesting side effect is that the oxidation rate goes up when you add HCl to the gas. Now what we think is that the HCl is reacting with oxygen and it forms water uh, and when you do this in a dry uh, environment. Uh, you don't really notice an increase in the, in the rate for uh, wet oxidation, but in a dry oxidation the HCl is going to react with O2, it's going to form water, and that water is going to cause higher reaction rate because water reacts faster than O2. All right, last thing oxide growth geometry. When we grow an oxide film, the oxide expands both up and down from the original silicon surface. Let's see if we can explain that. Here I show the density in atomic weight or molecular weight for silicon dioxide and silicon. So the density of silicon, 2.33 grams per cubic centimeter. The atomic weight of silicon is 28. The density of silicon dioxide is about the same as silicon, 6.27, but the molecular weight you see is much higher. It's 60.09. Obviously, it's going to be higher molecular weight. That means the molecular density, the number of moles of substance per unit volume, is quite different. So I simply divide the density by the atomic weight or the molecular weight, and we get the molar density. The molar density of silicon is 0.083 moles per cubic centimeter, while the molar density of silicon dioxide is smaller. 0.0378 moles per cubic centimeter. Now, a mole of oxygen is going to react with a mole of silicon to form silicon dioxide. And so, this molar density means the ratio of the molar densities is going to be proportional to the ratio of the thicknesses. So, the molar density of SiO2 divided by the molar density of silicon is about 0.455. Well, the molar density of silicon multiplied by the thickness of silicon consumed has to equal the molar density of silicon dioxide multiplied by the thickness of the silicon dioxide that's grown. Therefore, this 0.455 is also the ratio of the thickness of silicon consumed to the thickness of silicon dioxide grown. As a result, you can think of the surface of silicon initially being here, and when we get an oxide film growing, it grows up and down, consuming uh, 0.455 of that thickness going down compared to the 0.545 of the thickness going up from the original surface. This volume expansion is going to have some uh, important significant effects in our use of growing silicon dioxide when we consider three-dimensional structures that we're building, not just flat, plain old wafers growing oxide uniformly in one direction. Um, when we have other structures involved, this, this, uh, this expansion of volume will have a very significant impact. And we'll see that especially in the locos uh, isolation process, which we'll look at soon. So, in Lecture 12, what have we learned so far? It's been a little bit longer lecture than most of the others. Let's take a look. You should be able to make calculations using the deal growth model. It's the main thing. Uh, you're going to have homework problems. Um, given a thickness, how long should I oxidize? Given a certain oxidation uh, time, what's the thickness going to be? Um, you, know, have to, you need to know what the linear and parabolic rate constants are, be able to describe them. You need to understand how to use tau when an initial oxide film is on the wafer. Of course, when we don't have an initial oxide film but we're using dry oxidation, we also need to use tau, but in a different way, kind of as a fudge factor, to make the deal growth model work. And that's the next point. Understand why tau is used for dry oxidation when our film thickness is bigger than 30 nanometers. How does pressure affect oxidation rates? 
out of crystal orientation affect oxidation rates. We also have the, the impact of uh, doping and the impact of uh, HCL uh, that you should be able to remember as well. Well, that's a lot, and this sums up our description of the Deal Grove model and how oxide is grown thermally.